Nedra, welcome. Thank you for having me. It's such an honor to have you, you know, in many ways, you and your runaway best-selling book shed a light or created the boundaries conversation, if you, if you will. And I think led so many people, including myself to take full inventory of the boundaries in our lives or, or lack thereof in some instances. With that said, for those who are maybe unfamiliar with your work, people have maybe been living in the woods uh, <laughs> for the past year. I feel like you've been everywhere. Can you start by just giving a, a brief primer on how you think about boundaries? I think of boundaries as rules, expectations, parameters, needs that we have for ourselves and that we express to others and we uphold within our relationships and our culture and our interactions with people and all sorts of things. It is basically a operating manual for who we are and what we need. And it seems like we're not so good at setting boundaries, specifically healthy boundaries. Well, sometimes we are good in some areas and not others. There are many of us who are excellent at setting boundaries, maybe at work and terrible at doing so in romantic relationships. Some of us can do very well in romantic relationships and not do so well with our family. So we can be really amazing in some areas with setting boundaries and not so great in other areas. And you know, the, the book was written pre pandemic and like anything, I'm sure our, our, our boundaries have changed. I'm curious during the pandemic, is there a particular area that you believe we're, we're, we've, you know, that's come to the forefront in terms of our boundaries that potentially has room for improvement? I would say we had to really focus in on work-life harmony. Many of us had to figure out working from home sometimes with other people in the home, how to still do all of the things we had to do while maintaining a job in the space that we're living, we're working out, we're eating here, you know, is now an entertainment center. So Initially, it was very challenging because we already struggled with work-life issues. We already struggled with figuring out ways to fit in a workout and all this other stuff. So when the pandemic happened and boundaries were forced upon us, it was kind of like sink or swim. It just, <laughs> it was very challenging for most of us to figure out what do I need and how do I start to achieve some of the goals I have for myself. Well, it makes a lot of sense if I'm living in a studio or one bedroom and I'm on my couch and my couch used to be the place where I, I watch TV or maybe lie down to take a nap. And now it's the place I also eat my lunch at work and I also work on my laptop. Then, then this area, which maybe perhaps was a little bit of a sacred space, if you will, is now just mm -hmm. used for everything and, and it's hard to separate. Absolutely. Yeah, I think. Burnout was at an all-time high, and we learned very quickly that we, are, we already had a problem and it was getting worse. We saw a lot of people quitting their jobs in the pandemic, right? Because it was like, I can't do this. This is not rewarding. It's not fulfilling. It's not worth the money and the headache. So many reasons people started to walk away from not just jobs, but sometimes careers because we were forced into evaluating, not just with our relationships, but also with work, what is really important. And we did we evaluate those sort of things with relationships. I know for me, it made me really look at who is worth spending more time with, who do I want to enjoy with, you know, this 30 minutes that I get to leave the house and grab a quick phone call. Who do I choose to call? Who will I choose to invite into this inner panic that I'm experiencing? So it really showed um, me in particular which relationships I value. And so zooming out again, you, you talk about in the book that there are six types of boundaries. Can you briefly walk us through each of the six? Yes. The first type of boundary that we have is sexual boundaries. And 
that is our body. It is what we do intimately or what we choose not to do. And it's important always to remember that kids can never consent. Ever, ever, they cannot consent. Within the sexual boundaries, that's where we talk about sexual abuse, molestation, sexual assault, all of those things typically have some sort of legal ramification tied to them with sexual boundaries. So that is a really big area. And legally, there are consequences for violating um, those boundaries. Certainly not enough laws, but there are laws in place. Another um, area is physical. When we are touching someone without permission, we are in their physical space in the pandemic. One of the things that came out of it was six feet back. You know, that is a physical perimeter around our bodies, you know, not standing too close to people. And there are some times where you see these clips on the news where people are fighting because someone was too close, but that was a physical boundary violation. Emotional boundaries. This is where we, we express our feelings. We talk about our feelings and the violations that we see commonly is people telling us how to feel. You know, I'm really sad about that. Oh, you shouldn't be sad. Oh, it's not that bad. Oh, it'll get better. All of those sort of things are boundary violations because people are entitled to feel whatever they need to feel for whatever reason. If someone dies and they're angry, it's okay that they're angry. It's more helpful to try to talk to them than to try to tell them what they should and should not be feeling in that moment because we feel things based on our relationships, based on our needs and our experiences and so many reasons. So talking people out of their feelings is a boundary violation. Intellectual boundaries, those are our thoughts and ideas. And again, people will tell you, you should not think that way. You should not feel that way. Now, one of the topics that came up last year was political ideas. How do we talk to people who have different political ideas? On social media, how do we manage these relationships, sometimes with strangers around their expression of ideas. Sometimes those ideas are harmful and sometimes they are not. They're just irritating, which can be another harm, right? It's an annoyance. But there are all sorts of ways in which we can violate a person's intellectual boundaries, but it is their thoughts and their ideas. Another type of boundaries is materialistic. So your materials, your things, your possessions, things that you own, your money. One of my favorite um, and most common violations is, you know, loaning things out to people, letting people borrow things and them not returning them in the condition in which they were loaned or not returning things at all. I remember in college, I loaned a friend 20 bucks and I said, hey, do you have my $20? And they said, what $20? Oh my gosh, my heart was crushed. And I said, I will never loan this person money again. And I mean, it was years later and they would say, do you have five? I don't have anything. <laughs> I was just, I was so burned that they, you know, they conveniently forgot that I loaned them $20 and I really needed it back at, you know, in that time I needed it. Another area of boundaries where I would say we suffer greatly. And this is the, one of the biggest areas, one of the areas that I talk about the most. It's time. Time boundaries. I also think it's the area that we have the most control over. No one on this earth gets more than 24 hours. Somehow we look at a person living their 24 and we will say, how do they do that? It is like they get the same 24 you get. Now, if they want to get up, work out at 5 a.m., go to work, come home, do all of these other things, that is their business. But we're all getting the same 24. Why do they keep asking me to do things? Because you keep allowing it. It is your time. and You have the ability to say no around how you spend your time or you can say yes to how you want to spend your time. So time is the one that I would say that I talk about the most because it impacts the way that we can enjoy life. It, in, it impacts our time on earth. It is one of the things that we give away in ways that we don't even think about it as giving it away. You know, when we say yes, we're giving away time. When I agreed to meet with you, I gave up an hour. So we have to be very intentional around how we're using that time, what we're saying yes or no to, because it is 
such a huge part of our experience. Was that six or was that five? Oh, I feel like it was six. I, I, I think it was six. Okay, great. But, but regardless, where you're going anyway is, is where I wanted to go. So whether it was five or six, we're moving on. I think what you're hitting, I'm, I'm being very respectful of your time. You're on the clock. We're on the clock. No, 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 uh, no, no. So I, I think what you're hitting on, you know, when you're talking about that person who gets so much done in the day, successful people. And can you share what you think successful people get right about boundaries in their personal life or just in general? They, they seem to be doing something right with regards to boundaries. They understand the power of time. They understand the power of even doing little things can be a real big distraction. I get really distracted sometimes and, and I'll think, oh, this will just take me two minutes and it takes me an hour to figure out how to change a final or something. Just all of these different things that we do with our time and we really allow it to keep going and we're not intentional and it really disturbs what we're able to do within a day. And I think successful people understand the value of time. They understand the importance of having boundaries around saying yes and no. They're more inclined to say no. I think you hit the nail on that. They're very conscious about how they spend their time and I think are, are very cognizant of what will move the needle and what won't in terms of their time. Absolutely. I was recently reading an article about Warren Buffett. And it was saying how Warren Buffett, all of the things, it was like a list of all of the things he says no to. And I was like, oh my gosh, what does he say yes to? Uh, but it was a whole list of like, he doesn't go to, you know, insider events. He doesn't, you know, work with more than 15 people. He doesn't do this. He doesn't do that. And I think it, it's a huge way to reserve your time, to to preserve your energy. I think... There are so many things that we think we have to do. And delegation is really a powerful tool that successful people use and they use it often. I often think about, you know, how long will it take me to learn something? And can I find someone who's a master to do it in a quicker amount of time? And it could be anything. I mean, it could be something I could watch a YouTube video for like how to change this toilet handle. Well, I have to watch the 20 minute video. Then I have to go to Lowe's and get the part. Then I have to go, you know, like all of these things. And yes, it seems like a, a simple task, but it was two hours when I could just call somebody and say, hey, can you come by? And they do it. And I pay up, you know, I cash up on the money and there we go. Building off the, you mentioned the physical earlier and you mentioned six feet, you know, when we're social distancing. And I can't help but think of what you and I are experiencing right now in, in the Zoom mm -hmm. culture where yes, we're not in the same location, but you know, we're up close and personal. How do you think about Zoom and FaceTime and you're, we're not physically together, but we're kind, we're kind of pretty close. H how do you think about Zoom, if you will, and how it's maybe changed our perception around boundaries in, in this sense? I, I'm not sure. Zoom is really interesting because I've read some things that say it, you know, with work meetings, people who are introverts have had more opportunities to speak up because they don't like to talk in front of these large crowds. But guess what they love to do? Get in that chat box and ask questions and all of those sorts of things. So I think there is some benefits to the digital world that we live in now. And I think there are some drawbacks. And for each individual, those things will be different. In terms of the boundaries here, we've had to recreate what boundaries look like. There's a whole movement of, you do not have to have your camera on, like allowing people to just be present without showing face is a new boundary that I'm hearing. So. In any new thing that comes up, we have to consider what are the boundaries. That's what, you know, happened throughout history. You know, when you build a new town, it's like, okay, who's going to be the mayor? What will the rules be? What time will, you know, like all of these things. So we have to come up with some sort of structure because without it, 
there is chaos. Without it, we are just like, what do we do? And so we have to create this sort of formula to say, this is how we operate in a digital world. In terms of operating in a digital world and setting healthy boundaries, I, I, I can't help but think of social media, specifically Instagram. What is healthy or unhealthy Instagram usage behavior look like in your opinion? How do we know if we've got a boundaries problem on social media? You have a boundaries problem when you are in the space for more time than you want to be doing things that do not feel good to you or for you. I don't know if there's a time limit that we could put on social media usage that is healthy or unhealthy because I think it's based on your intention in the space. I think it's based on other things in life. Is it okay for me to not pay attention to my kids and, and be on social media all for three hours in the evening? Maybe not. Is it okay for someone who does not have children to be on social media in the evening if they don't, if everything else that they need to do has been done? Like, how do we figure out what those boundaries are? It's really tough because it's based on mental health, is based on emotional health, is based on the other things you need to do in life. What I will say is most people will report that they don't like being on social media as as much as they are. They feel like they have an issue with it. And that's when it's a problem. When you feel like you have an issue with it and you see the impact that it is having on your life. Each and every Monday on Instagram, I host a Q&A where I just answer questions. And often one of the main questions is, how long do you spend on social media? Because I have a pretty large community. I have over a million folks in my community. So people assume that I'm just sleep with this phone in my hand, that it's just like, you know, we are one. And I spend about an hour and a half on social media, typically less than that. I don't follow a lot of folks when I go on there. It's really to engage or to create or curate. I'm not in the space to, to do other things. I want to be very intentional in the space. Now, sometimes I get lost. I'm a human and I go on a roller coaster looking at candles or something. But for the most part, there is intentionality bet behind you know, using it. And even when I, you know, go off the rails and use a little more time than I want to, I don't beat myself up for it because I'm a human. And it is entertainment to some extent, but I do think it's problematic when we see it impacting our relationships. I've been out socially and you have to say to people, can you, can you put your phone down? <laughs> you know, can you, hey, I'm right here. I'm the person that you DM'd me, <laughs> you know, that does happen sometimes that we are using it at times or in ways that are harmful. And we have to recognize that it will be here just like TV. Can you imagine that at some point TV was like this terrible thing that people didn't want to have because you thought it would suck time or radio or, you know, anything like there have been conversations about all of these sorts of things throughout history that this will take all your time. This will fry your brain. And we have to adapt to the tools that we have in our world. So speaking of Instagram, you had a great post on your Instagram the other day about being defensive and look, we all do it. When we catch ourselves saying, you know, that wasn't my intention or let me explain myself. And, and, and again, I'll reiterate, everyone does this, myself included. What should we be saying instead when we catch ourselves being defensive? Mm -hmm. That's what we should say. Mm -hmm. No. Because <laughs> it's such a, it's a knee jerk reaction for it's, it, it's, it, it's instinctive. For many of us, you say something, you maybe feel like you hurt someone and you right away, you want to blurt something out. We have to remember that it really doesn't make the other person feel better. It doesn't make us seem less offensive, but it certainly makes us seem like a poor listener, a poor observer of people, a person that doesn't understand that a person could have an issue with us. I do not like when people say things about me that aren't wonderful. I only want you to say great and warm things. I love compliments and affirmation. But when someone says to me, oh, you loud or oh, you were late and all of these things, 
I have to think about that and say, hmm, I was. There is no lie being told. Now, do I like the truth? Absolutely not. But I understand it. And if I have a problem with it, guess what I could do? Try to be on time next time. Do that thing better that you're saying I did poorly. I can, I, that's really an opportunity for me to change my behavior if I want to. Now, there may be some things you have a problem with. And I say, oh, you know, I don't really like talking loud, you know, whatever. But I think it's a wonderful tool for you to have to be able to change some things about yourself. It's kind of like a survey. That's why they do surveys, right? So you'll have some sort of consumer experience and say, you know, well, this part of the website didn't work so well. That's what people are saying to us. This is the thing that's not working so well. And we have an opportunity to adjust it. So uh, to build off that, I've got some other real world examples. <laughs> so it, what about, you know, pe people are getting back out there and meeting people in real life. What do you do when a friend has a pattern of canceling? How do you have that mm -hmm. conversation? There's two ways to have that conversation. Um, well, two ways to handle that. One way is to set a boundary with yourself and perhaps consider inviting them to things. Because if this is a truly flaky person, I don't know if you telling them that is going to change their behavior, right? But what you can do is remove them from the invite list and say, you know, perhaps I shouldn't invite this person because they're not going to come or they're going to cancel at the last minute. Years ago, I invited a friend to um, the movies with me. And this friend is very clear. I don't like going to the movies, but every time I would go, she would say, why didn't you invite me? So I invited her. Worst experience at the movies ever. Worse. She talked during the whole movie. She got up, had a phone call. I was like, oh my gosh, I just want to watch this movie. Why did I do this? What, what did I do after that? I never invited her to the movies again. <laughs> I don't have to tell her you're terrible at the movies. <laughs> you know? Well, then people stop going to movies. So it all worked out. <laughs> it did. It did work out. But I think sometimes the boundary is with us and we have to change the way that we engage with this person. There are other times when we do need to have a conversation and say, it is very important to me that you come to this thing. Can you honor that? And if you can't, please say no. And another real world example. What, what about a coworker who just seems to complain a little too much? Mm. What I've become aware of is people who are chronic complainers are not aware that they're chronic complainers. They think that they're just talking. They, they don't have a filter for, you know what, this is a complaint and this is my eighth complaint. You hear that. They may not hear that. So I wonder again, even in telling them, can they filter out when they're complaining? Now we're trying to teach them a new skill. Now we have to teach you to figure out what a complaint looks like, what it sounds like, because you may have the assumption that you're just talking about a problem. But for me, I hear those problems as complaints. I have the opportunity to shift the conversation. I have the opportunity to maybe talk to this person a little less. I have the opportunity to even start the conversations. One wonderful thing we could do with chronic complainers is start the conversation in a way that you want to go. Oh my gosh, did you see the last episode of Dexter? There are topics you know not to ask these people about. You know, they have those topics where they'll really go. If you start talking about politics, you're like, oh my gosh, why did I bring that up? So whatever those topics are, make a list of them and never, ever bring them up to this person because you know they will complain. So again, what can you do on your side? Because what we think of as setting boundaries with people is us trying to change them. That's what I think the previous definition of, I'm telling this person my boundary. They have to stop complaining that's changing now. Now you can determine how you listen. You can determine what you do when they complain, but you can't make them stop complaining. They may not even know what a complaint is. Well, I'll segue to something else you, you talk about in the book. And I thought it was very powerful is the relationship between expectations and boundaries. Mm -hmm. And we need to be mindful of the expectations we have. Mm -hmm. How should we be thinking about 
ex, you know, I'll use the example of you can't change someone. And so on one hand, if there's someone in your life who, you know, you, you, you have a history with, or you have a fondness for, but you can't try to change them, but maybe they're not giving you everything you need. And, and maybe that maybe they're draining right now. How mm -hmm. do you think about, do you change expectations for that person? I think so many people struggle with when a relationship, you know, I read something once, I don't know if there's any science to it. Maybe there is, but you know, the, the average relationship lasts seven years. How do you think about expectations, boundaries, and relationships that have potentially run their course and friend <laughs> friendship, I'll say friendship, I'm not like you know, not necessarily a romantic relationship, but a friendship sometimes have a, a time period, a beginning and an end. When I think about friendships, we would not be able to keep all of the friends that we've created. If you think about your friend from kindergarten, first grade, second grade, we, we can't maintain all of these relationships, right? And so just within the natural order of growth, some of these things will drift away. And it makes sense that they will drift away because often we meet people in the state that we're in. So if we're in a video game state, we're meeting all the video game friends, right? And guess what happens when we don't want to play video games anymore? We find friends who want to do other things. We find friends at work who also enjoy psychology. We find friends that, you know, all of these sorts of things. So as we are changing in the world and shifting, our friendships will shift as well. So this shedding is not necessarily bad. And we don't have to have these huge monumental, like, I don't like you anymore. I no longer want to play video games with you. <laughs> we don't have to do that. That's not necessary because there are times when we can go back to relationships. You know, I've, I've certainly, and I'm sure you have, you've run into someone and you're like, oh, wow. Like, and they're in a different space. You're in a different space. And there is still something there in the friendship. But will we keep every friend that we meet close to us forever and ever and ever? No. And that's why it's important that we enjoy the time that we have and allow those moments of, of pause. And we allow people to drift away because it's just the natural order of things. We cannot keep everything. And, and I think... I did a show with Esther Perel a while back and she had some advice, you know, if you're looking, a lot of people are looking to reconnect, you know, during COVID and she said, you'll learn a lot about th the potential of this relationship, picking up steam again by the response. It's as simple as, Hey, you know, been thinking of you would love to catch up and you'll learn a lot from the response. Is the response warm? Is it neutral? Is it nothing? And, and just that response for people who maybe haven't, you haven't been as close to in recent years, will tell you a lot about the potential of that relationship go forward. I love that. That is wonderful for people who are self-aware, right? right? That seriously, that is <laughs> wonderful. Like, you know, I believe one of my gifts to be understanding how people receive me, right? Like reading their energy, like, oh, I'm going to get this job. Like I could tell by this person's body, you know, like I, I, I can kind of gauge like, oh, that was a bad one. Not getting it. You know, like, oh, this is going somewhere. But I think often because of what our agenda is, we don't care about the other person's response. They can be as dry as they want to be. Hey, thinking of you, love to catch up. And they could text Okay, and we still texting them. Hey, I text you the other day and we're just still, and it's like, read the room. But I think s some of us cannot read the room. Some of us don't understand when people are saying, I don't want any more contact. This isn't working for me because they don't want to. They want that thing more than they care about what your response is to them wanting to be in your life. I've had people you know, share stories of me, of people outright asking things, you know, coworker getting married and you're, you know, hey, you're not going to invite me. Well, they didn't invite you. That, I mean, that is the, do, do we need, now you're asking them and it puts people in an awkward position to have to tell you, 
you know, oh, we're only, but they've all, they've already responded in a way that, that, you know, some people can figure out and some people cannot. I think because of who we are, we go into things with our own agenda. And even if someone is, you know, coming across as cold, uninterested or whatever, there are people who will continue to press on. So when you say people coming off as cold, uninterested, you know, we're talking about self-awareness, having the ability to have difficult conversations. This is something that didn't exist. Um, um, 47, this didn't exist when I was younger, but it is very much a thing now is ghosting. Mm -hmm. Ghosting wasn't a thing. Like I would never, ever think of not responding to someone who maybe offered me a job or not showing up to work. <laughs> you hear crazy stories. We haven't, it hasn't happened to us here, but like you hear, you read crazy stories where people don't, you know, accept the job and then don't show up to the first day and they, they didn't have the heart to, to tell the person who hired them that, that they were going somewhere else or just relationship ending by ghosting. It, it's, it's a, there are numerous examples. Everyone know what, knows what ghosting is, but what do you think is driving this? And it doesn't seem healthy to me. Ghosting doesn't seem healthy because we have become a little more expressive in society. We don't like to hear people say anything about us or we don't like to hear um, any opposing views. And sometimes not in the job situation, that is truly a person not wanting to face someone and say, hey, I don't want this anymore, right? But in our relationships with other people, I have been shocked by people who say, you can tell me anything. And then you tell them something and they get very upset, right? <laughs> I don't, I want people to be honest. You really don't, they really don't want people to be honest, but it sounds like something good to say. And people know that about you sometimes. So when they try to say something to you, it doesn't even have to be anything big. It could be little small stuff. And based on how you react, they won't tell you this big thing of, hey, I don't want to come to your thing. They may just ghost you because they don't even know how to tell you because you wouldn't even allow them to you know, show up five minutes late without jumping down their throat. So there are, there are, you know, I think there are different things that we have to consider with ghosting. Sometimes it is truly a person, just like you said, they don't have the heart, the courage, the bandwidth, the capacity, and so many other things just to say, I want to end this. I'm not interested. This isn't working for me. And let's face it, it is very hard to terminate. It is hard to terminate. To watch somebody's face when you terminate something, especially someone you love, to end a relationship, that can be really hard. Sometimes to quit a job, all of these can be really hard things. Sometimes when we quit jobs, people, you know, they ask this question like, well, why are you quitting? It's like, no, do I have to say why? You know, there anything that makes us uncomfortable at this point people can, you know, they opt to ghost <laughs> because we don't want to deal with it. I don't know if there's a solution there other than allowing people to speak with you and, and being able to speak with you openly and really inviting people in when they have something to say or when you disagree with them, really being open to feedback, which sometimes we are not. Sometimes we are and people still ghost us. So that's a tough conversation. I had a post on that once and I had a ton of comments. Oh my gosh, I had so many comments from people who'd been ghosted and they were just like, Ghosting is never a good thing. How can you say that sometimes people do it because, you know, they lack, they were very upset that I wasn't like jumping on the, the people that were ghosting, but sometimes it's just hard to say stuff. It really is. Well, I agree. And something, look, difficult conversations are difficult by mm -hmm. nature. They're not easy, even for those who've you know, have had thousands of difficult conversations. Yes, you start to strengthen those muscles, but you never look forward to it. Mm -hmm. They're always difficult. They do get easier the more you have. You, you accumulate some muscle memory there, but they're always difficult. And with that mm -hmm. said, I, I think if you're not coached in them 
or you're not making a concerted effort to get good at them. And after all, like who wants to get good at difficult conversations, unless it kind of comes with the territory or it's inherent in your role or what you do at work or, or just your personal life, it happens. What I love about your book is, you know, look, setting healthy boundaries is work. And what you do so well is you actually walk people through mm -hmm. so many different scenarios, essentially like how to have the conversation, how to do it, because you have the, you, people need a playbook for this. It's not easy. Like doing th there's work to be done, setting healthy boundaries. You just don't wake up in the morning and say, all right, it's healthy boundaries day. I'm, I'm good. Let's do it. You know, bring on that, bring on the awkward uncle at Thanksgiving. No one looks forward to it. I just thought about the ghosting and boundaries connection. Often when people are setting boundaries in relationships, it's because they care about the relationship. And ghosting says, I no longer care about this relationship. That is an ending of a relationship, actually. But when people are placing boundaries with you, it is best to consider it a healthy step because they are trying to continue with you. And so when you're going down a path with someone that's difficult, something you talk about is the difference between threats and ultimatums. It's very nuanced, but can you walk us through the difference between threats and ultimatums? Threat is something that we do not have any intention of following through with. We are simply saying it to persuade someone to do what we want them to do. An ultimatum is almost like an episode of intervention at the end where the family says, if you do not accept this treatment, we will no longer pay your rent. That is an ultimatum. If you do not accept this treatment, we will no longer pay your rent. We're not cutting you out of our life. We're not doing all these other things. But the one boundary we have is we will not pay your rent. Now, if they have no intention of holding that boundary, then they have threatened that person. But if the intention there is to hold that boundary, they have given them, I would say, a successful ultimatum. Often we are using ultimatums as a way to control other folks' behavior, to scare them into different things that we want them to do. And again, when we are pushed up against the wire and they're like, hey, I, I need that money for rent, we're like, okay, but don't ask anymore. That wasn't an ultimatum, that was a threat. So in my life, when I think of threats and ultimatums, one area of improvement strikes around 3 a.m. when my two or four and a half year old wakes up and is angry or screaming and I find myself in the threat and ultimatum in that vortex, if you will. <laughs> So, so I'll segue to kids. You talk about this in the book, kids and boundaries as parents. And, and I think all parents love their children. All parents want to be better parents than their parents. All, all parents want to do the same, do, do what's right and build, you know, healthy, happy, resilient, good natured, kind little humans, but we're not perfect. I am not mm -hmm. perfect. What do you think are the biggest pitfalls when it comes to parents and kids and setting boundaries? Parents believe that they know what's best, even when a person is telling them otherwise. And with persons, with children, it is the kid. The kid is saying, oh my gosh, this is too tight. This is itchy. This is nasty. I don't like this person. And it's like, no, this is a nice person. And it's like, well, I don't think so. <laughs> it's like... I don't think this is a nice person. I don't feel safe talking to this stranger. I don't want to wear jeans. Like all of these things that kids do. And we're like, no, you should want to do these things. We know what's best. And one thing that I wonder is, does this really matter? You know, in a grand scheme of things, sometimes when we get into these grid locks with kids, does it matter if they wear, I have two daughters, does it matter if they wear jeans or leggings? Does it matter if they eat all of their macaroni or two spoons? Does it matter if they hug this IT that they haven't seen in four years? You know, like all of these things that we try to have these power struggles over. How important is it 
what are we teaching them in terms of honoring themselves? I think we know how we feel about people. We know what our taste buds are like. We know what feels comfortable on our bodies. One way to really honor a child's boundaries is to remember yourself as a child. If you just close your eyes for 10 seconds and think about all of the little preferences you had and the things you would have liked and wouldn't like and did like and all of this stuff, you will understand the importance of these small humans having some autonomy, you know, whatever they can at their little two-year-old, four-year-old ages for you, what things can you allow them to just have some, okay, yeah, okay, okay, we'll stop. You can pick the flower up. Yes, we're walking. We may miss the school bus, but fine. Pick up the flower. You know, hopefully the driver will see us. <laughs> you know, like, you know, how do we give them structure in some areas and relax in others. I, I think that we have to allow kids to to have a voice in some ways. We have to be willing to hear them. And it really builds loving relationships, not just, you know, ones where kids respect you. Because I think I grew up in the age of you will respect your parent, but that didn't necessarily mean that you loved your parent to pieces and they were your favorite human in the whole wide world. But you did listen to them because if you didn't, there was some sort of consequence. But I want to be loved and respected. And so I, I do, with my children, go out of my way to honor boundaries when I can. Now, all the time I can't honor boundaries. At 10 o'clock at night, we cannot have ice cream, right? There are some things that just won't happen, but there are other things that I can be flexible around because I remember what it was like to be a kid and to have preferences. How old are your girls now? Five and seven. Oh, wow. We're like the same yes. age. I'm just a little behind you. So I'm curious, again, you put boundaries on the map. And I don't think that's an understatement. And I'm curious, writing a book about boundaries, becoming the boundaries expert, and in some ways, I know you were already successful, but became an overnight success. How has your relationship with boundaries changed since the success of boundaries? My integrity is unfolding more. Because I write so much about the work of boundaries, I am certainly holding myself accountable more. When I say, you should not allow people to mistreat you, I'm like, oh my gosh, you just let somebody mistreat you. Um, yeah, just, <laughs> the, the integrity work that I'm having to do in relation to this boundaries book has been actually enjoyable. It's been enjoyable because before it was like I was doing a really good job, but now I can see how it is changing my life to really hold those boundaries and areas where I was a little loose to really tighten up in some relationships where I allowed things to go too far. I certainly speak up more for my needs. I am, you know, no, I cannot do this. Yes, I can do that. So those things have increased. I think when you're talking to people about, challenges in any area, it is important that you are practicing a lot of the things that you're telling other people to apply. I'm curious. I know it's hard to generalize. And in the book, you go into such extraordinary detail around the different types of boundaries, uh, you know, rigid, porous, healthy, just you, you cover everything. But I am curious if you had to generalize, what are most people just still getting wrong? Like, is there low hanging fruit that you're just shocked where, wow, everyone's kind of getting this one wrong right now, or there's a lot of area for improvement in this area. The biggest, I have two. One of the biggest things that people get wrong is believing that it is everyone else's responsibility to figure out what their boundaries are and to honor those imaginary boundaries. We think that there is this level of common sense that exists in society and everyone knows, you know, all of these rules that they are not following. That it's, it's like we believe that people are just walking around doing these things and they know better. And I know that people don't know better. 
They don't know better. We have to teach people how to be in relationship with us. We have to speak up things that we think are super common sense. I have a rug outside, a doormat outside of my house, and it says, kick off your shoes. It's from uh, an escape song. Kick off your shoes and relax your feet. So I, I would assume if I saw, that means take your shoes off when you go in someone's house, right? I still have to tell people, can you take your shoes off? Now, some people come in and they take their, they kick off their shoes. Some people come in, they kick off their shoes, right? I still have to ask some people, can you remove your shoes? That's not common sense. A lot of people probably don't even know the song. Even though it says kick off your shoes, they may say, oh, what a nifty rug. <laughs> well, I don't know. It, it, isn't the other big give, give, giveaway where you walk in and you see everyone's shoes? <laughs> Usually that's a telltale sign. Again, you know, these are all <laughs> things that I would, you know what I do when I go in people's house, I just take my shoes off. I prefer it, you know, because I, I, I just prefer it. But anyways, you would think that, but we still have to say it. We still have to communicate those things to people. And so often we think it, we think that it is other people not honoring our boundaries when really we haven't even spoke the boundary. The last relationship, I ended it because for a long time I thought, maybe I'm not communicating my boundary well. And then we had a difficult conversation where the person told me all of these boundaries I've been setting with them and how they had not been listening because they didn't like them. And I said, oh, well, I can end this now. <laughs> here I was thinking, maybe I'm not being clear here. And they said, no, I heard you say that. I didn't want to do it. Oh, well, that's the end. <laughs> Second thing that we do is believe that Guilt means that we are not supposed to set boundaries. Guilt has many purposes. We can feel bad when we are actually doing something wrong. And we can feel bad just because we think it might be wrong. It could feel, it could be really good to us, but we could just have this belief system of you should support your family no matter what. Whatever resources I have to share them with other people, it's not okay to say no. We can have all of these beliefs that really disrupt our mental health and our emotions and all sorts of things. They're incongruent with how we feel and we will still believe them. And guess what that does? It causes a lot of issues. And we think the issue is, I should be able to set these boundaries without feeling bad. And it's like, you will have to set the boundary and feel bad. We'll have to do both. But as you practice setting those boundaries, it will be easier. I have set some boundaries where I've shocked myself. I'm like, oh, I can't believe I said that. Oh, that hurt my stomach. You know, I've even had to text some boundaries because I couldn't say the boundary. <laughs> I'm like, I got it. I got to get it out. You know, it is just best to get it out. However, you need to get it out. Now that we're in a digital world, I do believe we have to adapt to digital resources. There is a lot of people say, oh my gosh, this person communicated through text or they sent me an email. And I said, well, it is communication. If you could be hired through a, a email, can we be fired through the email? If I could ask you to be my partner through a text, can I also unpartner you via text? These are new considerations that we have to have. And maybe those are other conversations we need to bring up in relationships, like our preferred method of, you know, communication. But we do live in a world where technology is a resource for communication. In closing, you know, thinking about the future, where do you want the boundaries conversation to go? What are you interested in? I would love for the boundaries conversation to be an intention for us in most areas that as we are stepping into new roles, new relationships, new areas of life that we are considering what our boundaries are as we're becoming parents, that we're considering what boundaries do I need as a parent? What sort of communication do I want from other parents about my children? How do I want to engage with my in-laws around how they grandparent? I want us to have those conversations more proactively. And the more that I can teach people 
that as you step into new things, there are conversations that need to be had. As you shift, there are more conversations that need to come up. So for me, the next phase of this is really the, not just the awareness of boundaries, but the practicing of boundaries. I have a workbook coming out very soon. And the workbook is for the practice of boundaries, because I think the book was so much about here are all the issues and think about this a little bit. But the workbook is like, okay, think and practice. Now, here is the problem. Who do you need to tell? (laughs) Who do you write their name down? Write who you need to say. This is how you say it. When will you say it? It's, It's more of an accountability tool because we need to practice boundaries. I love it. Nedra, thank you so much. You're welcome.